What is this film about and who is this for? GIZ has been working on the links between government and conflict and digitalization for some time. In 2021, we held an international virtual conference, the Future Forum, with the topic, States, Societies, and People in the Digital Age Shaping a Global Transformation. This film summarizes the current state of the debate on risks and opportunities promoting governance and peacebuilding in the digital era. The film highlights some GIZ examples with content that was recorded during the Future Forum. It is a film for practitioners who want to get to an introduction and learn more about the digital transformation in the field of governance and conflict. It is directed at GIZ staff and GIZ partners working in this fields. The film is divided into the following sections. The future of human-centered digital transformation. Digital power to perform, changing of state and non-state actors. Social cohesion and peace building in the digital era. Inclusive digital democracy and deliberation. The future of human-centered digital transformation. Worldwide, there are many actors being involved in the digital transformation. What is the role of the EU and Germany? If I look at the EU level, indeed, I can see how many colleagues from other member states are currently in the process of building their digital capacities. Estonia, for instance, has a long-standing profile, as you all know, in the e-government field. Slovenia now took on the EU Council presidency and included the green and digital transition is one of the key priorities. So in that sense, I believe that together with, with our European partners, we can truly offer a comprehensive digital ecosystem approach that draws from our individual strength and digital capacities especially in the context of new actors coming into the field of digital development. We need to speak with one common European voice. Digital transformation is really a global issue and, and it's also a global issue that no one can, can tackle in an isolated way. So we really need to join forces, build a partnership, develop a further our capacity in the digital domain and uh, and on all keys as the European Union really we want to be the stimulation of this work uh, joint forces. What challenges are BMZ and GIZ facing facilitating a human-centered digital transformation? While more and more donors support the development of digital solutions in developing countries, the investments are still often duplicated and fragmented and therefore neither scalable or sustainable. So my vision is that in five years, we can empower all governments, particularly those in low resource settings to take ownership of their, their own digital futures. How do we frame digital transformation in the context of government and peace building? There are different stages and uh, we can see that at the macro level, for the whole history of technology and its impact on society, but also at a micro level, which is for each innovation that is put out there. With my disappointment as a, a leader in the in the civil society sector, uh, my disappointment is that we are usually not that much hurt until the harms are done, unfortunately. And this multi-stakeholderism approach, which basically calls for uh, having all these stakeholders sitting at the table together on, I wouldn't say, oh, yeah, ideally an equal, um, you know, an equal foot. Um, and, and, and that calls for, yes, collaborating, co-creating together, just like the infrastructure, mirroring the infrastructure of the Internet. Internet is a network of networks. And I think that the solutions that will come for the network of networks to be healthier and to bring, to continue to bring posit positive impact to our societies is by mirroring that interconnectivity. It's a time of innovation, definitely. Uh, we are mirroring the, the, the tool that we're using and the tool that we're overseeing, in this case, content moderation on Facebook and Instagram, and we are innovating. Uh, we're trying to think through what does it mean to protect freedom of expression on the social media platforms? Uh, what does it mean to protect people's safety on social media platforms? What does it mean to 
protect peace when uh, dealing with content on social media platforms? These are some of the questions that we're asking yourself. How can GIZ approach the digital transformation together with its partners? I mean, the spirit, huh? It's a, it's a time where we are all learning. It's a time to find uh, solutions together. And it's about creativity. So I think definitely take this up as a takeaway as well. I really like the phrase when digitalization hits communities, because I think this really describes what's going on. Digitalization is a context factor. It is happening. And we have to be there together with everyone else to see how we can shape it towards an inclusive uh, digitalization, towards a just digitalization. So that really inspired me. I think we cannot shy away from this task because it is happening and it's about shaping it together. And, um, and that really leads me to the third point, which I think is definitely an element, very important element of our work as GIZ, that we have to approach this in a very contextual manner. We really have to look at the sites, at the communities, at the local realities where we are, where we work with our partners to know what's actually best to shape this transformation. And it strikes me because in a way, this digital transformation debate is always so global. Mm. And I think you really made a point also with your examples to really make it also a very contextual element um, of what we have to look at. Focus area one, digital power to perform changing of state and non-state actors. How to address capacity deficits in the public sector. Having leaders who understand um, the benefits of some of this digital transformation that we're talking about. And usually it's interesting when we talk about these issues on capacity because everybody just assumes it's this technical thing. You keep people training and in courses, but it really goes back to this soft stuff that makes uh, for cultures and how people work together, the kind of mindset that is enabled and empowered in a particular workspace, be it in public sector or in any other sector. But, you know, focusing on the public sector, there is work to be done. Taking a little bit of the pressure off the public sector and saying, you know, they're, they're like the dumb ones that need to, to, to be educated. Um, someone says digital solutions are built by people working in the digital economy. They're not tailored to the needs of public authorities. What are the biggest obstacles for good digital governmental services? Those who are uh, working in the public sector, how many times uh, when you feel that you have some kind of an idea to do something and then you go then you go to the computer and for no particular reason the computer says no well then you go to the IT department and go and ask it and then the IT guys say no you should talk to the lawyers and then you go to see the lawyers and then they say no this is so very common in the public sector that uh, when deploying government digital services, then there are all these kind of hurdles. And last but not least, there is procurement. There are many hurdles and many obstacles, but the biggest hurdle is between our ears. Uh, digital development and digital transformation actually has got very little to do with technology. It's mostly about building a mindset and culture that is ready to adopt and change procedures. We are living in an age where stuff is changing faster than we, our systems potentially can. But we need to build our own governance mechanisms to adopt that. And our second recommendation is to apply a whole of government approach. What does the infrastructure look like? Are there frequent power cuts? How about digital literacy? Are we leaving behind the rural areas? There are common challenges in different developing countries, and we have to reach out to learn from others, regional and local experts, other countries, but again, also the private sector. For example, the one-stop shop concept has been mentioned to increase transparency and decrease uh, corruption. And I found this really interesting to further work on. We need to know how to adapt these learnings to a local context, also taking into account what solutions ex actually already exist, can be reused and improved. And of course, for all of this to work, there needs to be a high level of political will and uh, the sentence Diana Seng said is stuck in my head. They need to want it more than you. How do you overcome resistance to change? What is the magic key? The danger sometimes of thinking of this as a singular solution because in one hand, in the digital era, it leads us to solutionism where everybody then creates a supply to meet this demand for a singular thing, but it's really some form of snake's oil. A lot of what will make digital development actually viable for the different contexts 
we've spoken to, is really taking the time to understand the context in which you're trying to introduce them. And even the humility to figure out, is that the right approach? Am I the right person to bring this um, technology or this uh, solution to a particular area? And this is a really important thing to point out for development practitioners. Are you the right person to go to a rural community in Kenya where from and introduce digital IDs, for example, because you're offering, I don't know, access to water, access to education. Are you, is that the right solution even? You know, the source that we're looking for is that human element that actually does exist within us that leads us to ask in humility and to really figure out how do you go in and listen first? Start to build from where we are or what is already there. So, for example, um, when we were doing a SWOT analysis of the various legal frameworks uh, on data protection and privacy, we found that um, amongst uh, the data protection laws in Africa, there are a lot of similarities and commonalities. So it's not starting from that negative angle of there is no um, harmonization, but what is there and we start building uh, on it to ensure that we harmonize. I think um, it's kind of a low hanging fruit. Developing institutional capacity and building institutions is fundamental and incapacitating people. This is as important as investing in technology because the gains in economic development and rule of law can slide back really quickly in the hands of authoritarian regimes and they will use digital technology to do that. So institutional capacity is key. Second, not just digital, but really worry about the analog complements that are needed to make the whole package work, not for the technology just to be rolled out and not used. Third, I would think about the incentives at the ground level, all the way starting at headquarters for funders, uh, project managers who are incentivized to meet disbursement targets, occasionally impact targets, but there's a huge punishment for cutting back on projects that when you find they're not working on the ground, these are career destroying. And that's a problem. We end up with technology projects that go on for years and don't really give the impact or have unintended consequences. So we really need to have meaningful um, incentives for people who are funding these things to do the right thing. Focus area two, social cohesion and peace building in the digital era. There are many risks to peace and social cohesion through digital technologies. How can we deal with these threats? It's not the technologies themselves that have made people more uh, more prone to uh, stoking uh, conflicts or sowing seeds of discord. It is actually a symptom of something deeper and probably that has not had outlets in the offline world or in civic spaces elsewhere that people are leveraging these technologies to bring um, to, to, to light. However, however uh, we cut across it, whether it's valid or not, and depending on who's the arbiter of that. And so for those who are building programs like GIZ, I would say the most important thing you can do is make sure that whatever programs you call digital peace building, bring in those who've been working in the social aspects of, in the offline world, those who've been working in development aspects with communities, those who are looking at how technologies are shaping um, up, how they're governed, how algorithms are determining what we see, what we don't see, and bring all those things together to analyze this issue. We risk a lot by going into a silo and saying this is just solely a digital issue. No. Online, offline, online is this cycle that we need to understand better. And what we are seeing online is a mirror of what's happening offline. And maybe the question is, have we not been listening to what's happening in communities around the world. Who should we as GIZ partner with when we build our programs? Often, the technology is developed by private sector, implemented by govern governments, and surveyed and imposed upon people. Civil society then is in the role of, in the end, trying to hold governments to account. This is a rather negative, vicious cycle which poses these people against each other. Funders should really insist on any technology development and adoption by government having civil society from the beginning to the end. How can GIZ foster social cohesion and peace building in our partner countries in the digital age? Social cohesion requires a certain level of trust. Informality creates trust. Digital tools are an opportunity for people to connect with each other. 
But experiences show that many peace building activities actually require a face to face element in the end. So we need to use both approaches complementary. On social media, disinformation travels six times faster than the truth. Digitalization can be a challenge for social cohesion. We see that in many areas. So we need to invest in peace innovators who create alternative models. And while we're trying to keep the negative and hateful content outside, we need to increase the speed of the positive content. Focus area three, inclusive digital democracy and deliberation. How can we shape the digital transformation in a more inclusive manner? So we know that the people at the bottom of the pyramid are often on low wage, low productive, high risk jobs and sectors of the economy. One of the ways these digital markets help is by integrating them into global markets and global value chains. We see this in a lot of instances, for example, remote gig work platforms in South Asia, where people are designing logos for American buyers remotely earning higher wages than they would have done otherwise had they sold the same logo production in the country. But to do this, the digital worker needs an affordable and reliable broadband connection, the right skills and a bank account. I think that's in a way what we can do quite easily, even though there are a lot of lots of challenges there. But the long term thing is she also needs a banking system that looks at her small but regular income and offers a formal loan facility so that she can purchase land, buy a house or invest in a business. Because otherwise, while in the short term, she's slightly better off doing this gig work on a monthly or daily basis. In the long term, she is one paycheck away from falling back below the poverty line the moment the next shock hits, like the pandemic. I want to start with a brief illustration that will describe what inclusive digital democracy means to me. I usually use this analogy of a farm borrowed from my Ushahidi colleagues at the end of my presentations. But today, it will drive my point home better at the start. Digital platforms like Ushahidi are like fertile land. They represent the potential for greater participation, improved decision making and trust. The data and information we gather via these platforms are like having good seeds. Seeds that hold promise to flourish and yield good produce if appropriately handled. But without farmers to till, your fertile land and good seeds are useless. The farm will not flourish without people and the hard work into getting produce in that land. Usually, ordinary citizens better understand the issues they are dealing with. They know the context. They know the tensions. To have effective democratic societies, we need solutions that tap into the wisdom of these local people. Wisdom that is often ignored because we feel that people are too simple or are not educated in the conventional sense. What are good digital democracy tools that increase inclusion of all citizens in a society? For me, the answer to that, um, funny enough, is government itself. It would be the best tool because whatever is used uh, and works for whatever subgroup of people, governments ideally, or democracies as we, we like to think about them, are supposed to be in the business of serving people and knowing the people they're serving in a way that if in one particular area, service provision works better in oral language because that's a better way to communicate. They can interoperate that with folks who would use a tool like a digital tool that's SMS-based or otherwise to also bring in their views and news and all that. I don't know as yet that there's that tool that does all of that. And we already have so many digital divides, even among the connected, that we usually don't even pay attention to. So I'm not sure yet that we can think of it as an one tool so much as small sets of tools that work for different groups. Digitalization does not automatically improve democracy. Digital tools can help to improve public participation or accountability, but they also bear significant risks that we should not forget, especially when it's about leaving people behind. And therefore, we propose to adopt a human-centered design by default approach for all our projects, at least to complement the digital by default approach. Human-centered design should already be adopted in our project planning phase. And that means, for example, that during our appraisal missions, we should not only talk to government officials, but we should also have a meaningful engagement with potential end users. Similarly, we need human-centered designers on every project that we do in order to develop a digital solution. And ideally, these would come from the partner countries. 
However, in our current GIZEC structures, this is not easy to implement and we know that all. And we are often asked to come up with a solution before actually really understanding the needs of the user and the ecosystem. And therefore, we would really invite our commissioning parties to give us the necessary time and flexibility to leverage the human-centered approach. And if we take this seriously, it, it means that we need to follow the principle form follows function. And instead of putting into a project offer that we will develop mobile apps for public participation, we need to be more open-minded and impact-driven that this could also be a non-digital solution. Focus area four, data for development. What are important factors for the design of data for development initiatives? One um, condition of, of all these uh, programs and projects is uh, that, again, we will leave no one behind. And uh, in order to not to leave anyone behind, we need to make the, um, uh, the beneficiaries and the, the vulnerable people visible. And this, I mean, we've talked about this before, this only goes with disaggregated data. So I think any... Um, any program, any initiative, uh, data for development should aim at uh, fostering um, the, the the production of disaggregated data for, for gender at once. But also, again, I come back to this uh, for persons with disabilities and uh, and so on. Data governance is key. Our economies are becoming increasingly data driven and how we how we manage that asset is key right to how we um uh, have managing the risks of misuse um as dorothy pointed to but also managing the risks of underuse that it's not actually being used for for value creation so i think these are the the issues that are on the table and now the gold standards um you know they are uh not necessarily always applicable to to the context in which we work i mean particularly as we noted digital capacity to implement or to enforce rules is, is not the same in in many of the client countries that we're working in. So making sure that it is maximizing the reuse, managing the risks of misuse and building a, a social contract, if you like, that is very much context um, specific. What does gender data gap mean for a society? Deep-seated biases in data meant that before definitions of work and what comprised work were expanded in 2013 to account for unpaid activities, much of women's time was just invisible. And the message you could take from that data was that women were unproductive in the economy. However, they were not unproductive. They were spending their time in different ways, all of which had an important economic and social value. It just wasn't being shown by the data. And so the presence of gender data or its absence makes a statement about what is valued in our government, in our society, and across our shared global goals. How can a human-centric exchange of data improve public services? There's a lot of public data that will be extremely useful for private development and development in general, just like there is a lot of private data that will be useful for governments, and it has to be developed on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, I'd be very interested to, to listen to what can be done in the automotive sector. Things in agriculture, things in the medical field, things in the financial sector, each of the different categories of data may have different opportunities and, and, and challenges. People, you know, um, oftentimes feel very um, um, powerless. You know, um, you see this in, in many parts of the world where there's like cracks, like streets, there's um, um, street lights that are not working, you know, there's, um, you know, um, like traffic lights that are not working and people oftentimes feel that they can't do anything about it. So now we've developed a technology where you can use your phone to basically take a picture, for example, of a pothole. Um, and we then run our AI and machine learning models to basically detect what that is. Um, and then we're able to, for example, um, do um, 
like the depth calculation of that particular pothole. And then we are able to provide that information to government for government to then start automating some of their supply chain. For instance, um, create a purchase request based on that particular, you know, um, 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 reported incident by a, you know, like a regular citizen. So in that way, we are somewhat, you know, putting people, um, you know, in a way where they can somewhat influence government. What do governments in our partner countries need from GIZ? There is clearly no uh, proper policy making um, without data, uh, but not only uh, data, high quality uh, data. Uh, data that is inclusive, uh, that is free of bias, well understood and uh, disaggregated to make uh, visible all the um, vulnerable groups within the society. This is the data that we need for, for sustainable uh, development. Uh, what does this mean for, uh, for our uh, recommendations? Uh, we have two recommendations actually. Uh, firstly, uh, in order to make high quality data uh, available, governments and cities uh, need uh, adequate infrastructure, uh, governance uh, models and frameworks, uh, technology, but most importantly, people. Mm -hmm. We need to uh, be working closely with our partners to build their uh, capacities uh, and enable them to collect the data that they need and and to uh, develop the policies and solutions that best uh, suit their uh, local context. Government and private data economies, are they unlikely allies? Just the, the speed of innovation, you know, makes it um, a, um, very difficult for government to work with private sector. Misunderstanding or lack of communication between two parts from the beginning. I think it's an imbalance between the investment that private sector is doing and they would like to look for recognition about the value they have created from their data. And that from the government side, it's normally investment is normal, we have to progress, but that they are always struggling with what we have to protect and what we have to let grow. And the question of the benefit for users, I think Obrey gives a fascinating test case because there is a sort of mutualization of the benefit. What is happening is that he produces a private service that probably has its own business model. But if I understand correctly, the data that is then provided to the state is actually allowing the state to upgrade the infrastructure without having the need to put on the ground thousands of people who control whether there's a pothole, whether there's a lamp that is not functioning. And so in a certain way, Part of what we're discussing today makes me think that we are looking at a feedback loop here mm -hmm. where basically the uh, benefit of sharing data between private actors and public actors is actually using the state or the good agencies in the state as the mutualization tool for providing back the benefit of the sharing of the data in the first place. And I want to make a, a pun in, 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 in the end. The title of this, of this um, discussion was Unlikely Allies. Uh, I think companies and uh, governments are not unlikely allies. They're absolutely completely natural and um, necessary partners in leveraging the maximum value. How does GIZ currently address the digital transformation and the needs of their partners? Um, the, the second one I'd like to quickly present is the GIZ Data Lab, of which I have the honor to, to co-coordinate. And um, uh, you were talking about incubation and experimentation, and this is really the place to go um, within GIZ for uh, experiments with data for development. What we try to achieve together is um, finding new solutions um, with a data for development for our development challenges out there in our programs, but also to jointly work out how we can mitigate the risks. And why do you need a lab for that? Um, I mean, we can't experiment with, um, with our partners. I mean, you need a 
safe space where you can make, um, uh, where you can try things out, where you can fail and test and develop further. One of them uh, being Fair Forward, uh, where we try to demystify artificial intelligence and make them applicable um, for development cooperation. So that's um, that's a that's a big mouthful. So um, what we what we're doing is uh, to work with our partners from the digital ecosystem to make sure we have a human-centered and inclusive artificial intelligence uh, to get frameworks in place, to, but also get products in place that are then feeding into very concrete um, examples. And we have a task to scale now and a task to not do the app here and there, but rather uh, enable the ecosystem to work on a human-centric approach. And um, to maybe finalize with one uh, experiences that really stroke us in the implementation of that large scale program that we are doing in altogether 20 countries um, uh, uh, in the different in the three different world region what we realize is that we are not alone and we are not starting mm -hmm.